Slay your giants Take your weapons Slay your giants oh, Slay Goliath Slay Goliath Take your weapons Slay your giants
Everyone, blessings to you tonight. Everyone, blessings to you tonight. Blessings to you tonight.
I praise God tonight. <laughs> Everyone, blessings to you. I'm dealing with deepening the prophetic on your life. Deepening the prophetic on your life. Now, the prophetic anointing, it has different layers to it. Different responsibilities, different functionalities, different angels. There are different angels that you move with as a prophet. Now, by honoring a prophet that God has sent to you, it can't just be any prophet. There will be a transference of prophetic abilities. And this is the amazing thing about Jesus is that whatever you honor will intensify for you. Whatever you honor will intensify for you. So if you honor a prophet, prophetic abilities intensify in your life. You'll be able to see in the spirit at a degree. Now, that's all up to you. How much you see in the spirit is all up to you. You can decide to see at a height. You can decide to see at a dimension. It's all up to you. The kingdom of God has been made available for your enjoyment and for your pleasure. There's something called prophetic pleasure where I can see in the spirit off of my will, off of my spiritual goals, my desire for God. And as I pursue him, he permits me authority to see at will. Prophetic pleasure. Where I get to experience the pleasures of prophecy and the prophetic anointing. Where your eyes are open. Saints, the reason why I'm not a nosy person because what I need to see, God will show me. <laughs> so I'm not nosy. I don't give a dog what you're doing. If, if God want me to see it, he going to show me it. I'll see it in a dream. I'll see it in a vision. I've had many a times where I wrote some of y'all in JHM and I said, dot, dot, dot. How you know I was doing this, prophet? Because when I need to see, I'll see it. Like there's a couple of you all right now, you with men that you're not supposed to be with on this line. And when I say this, what I'm saying is the men are pop-up men. They pop up every now and again when you got an urge. They call you on the phone. Say, listen, can we... And that's... that's he, he don't love God. He don't love you. He don't love nobody. In prophetic pleasure, your eyes open up to see at the balcony of God the same way he sees from heaven because there's eyes in the spirit. There are eyes in the spirit. And let me tell you something. I'm not with this dog on third eye. Bull crap. The third eye is devilish. It will always be devilish. I had somebody tell me, oh, I, I would like to teach. I would like to show you about the third eye. Nope. <laughs> I don't deal with that at all. Holy Ghost ain't dealing with no dog on third eye. You ever hear somebody telling you about some third eye? No, they done stepped over into the satanic realm and that's not good. Many African prophets step into the third eye. If they get around a true man or, or woman of God, they can't really prophesy to you accurately. Third eye is not good. I'm saying that because many of you are hungry for the prophetic. So you, 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 you run over to people that you think are operating in it. But if the, if the person is filthy and you're hungry, you won't even see the filth. You understand what I'm saying? You'll just be wowed by what you see. The third eye is not, not God's will. It's not biblical. 
is not the Lord. And once you see somebody talking about third eye, know that that's not the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm not saying that somebody talk about the third eye, that they're, they're fully demonic. But what I'm telling you is that's not the Holy Ghost using them to talk about that. That's not his doctrine. That the, I, am, I know as a, as a major prophet, I'm very major in this anointing. I'm very heavy on it. If I was a little imma, immature or elementary, I wouldn't touch on this. But because I know I move in this full time daily, I have enough script from God, enough scrolls from God to decipher and articulate it properly. Saints, you ever heard men say, I don't know what's happening to me. I just know that I dot, dot, dot. That, that's a revelation that that man is, a lot of times, he's immature or he's not fully mature in the functionality of God. People like that can give you inaccuracy. You understand what I'm saying? Because here's what I'm saying. I can articulate what happens to me in a meeting. I can articulate the angels I see. I can articulate the fire I feel. I can articulate the direction that the wind of the spirit is blowing me into to pray for whoever I need to pray for. I know when I pray for somebody that their heart is hardened. I know if I pray for somebody and they're unbeliever. I know when the anointing wean off of me in a service. When I say that, it's because I'm encountering a hard-hearted spirit. Some people do not believe in the power of God, so you'll feel the atmosphere change. When you feel the atmosphere change, it's because God is just letting you know what you're dealing with. You ever see a man of God praying for somebody, bop, 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 and then you see people like, ah. Oh. And it's like a stunting of the power. It ain't got nothing to do with the man of God. Our job is to freely receive, freely give. But if the recipient does not want it, God is not going to exercise the strength of who he is to somebody that does not value the strength of who he is. He, he exercises his, his muscles when he sees humility and desire and craving and hunger. So when he see you wanting it, just like ain't no, ain't, ain't no real. You, you got to want a real man. If, if a real man see that you, Flexing, he's not going to try to rape you. It's only it's only the men that 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 don't care, that don't got no value, no preference, or none of that that will rape you. But a real man, he know, hey, you got to let me know that you 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 on one accord, because I ain't gonna take your cookies, <laughs> chocolate chip, almond, sugar cookie man, all of that. You got to make sure, <laughs> you got to make sure. Now, the same way God is with the prophetic anointing, he's not going to rape you. He's not going to take you over if you don't want to be taken over. That's why we have so many people going to hell. Because Jesus not going to make you serve him. But if you don't want to serve him, you got to still serve and you're serving the, the the victim, the defeated one, Satan himself. You have to serve Satan if you don't want to serve Jesus. So while he not forcing you to serve him, you still got to serve. So why serve somebody that hates you, that desires bad upon you? Listen, some of you all know somebody that wants to see your downfall at some point in your life. You know somebody that has wanted to see your downfall. Would you literally become a slave to somebody that wants to see your downfall, wants to see the worst happen to you, wants to see you broke, sick, struggling, going through issues, going through uh, confusion, going through curses? Would you really be a slave to that? But this is what so many people are doing. They're becoming a slave to the very one that hates them, jealous of them, desires to see them meet no good. 
You know why God puts a prophet in your life? That prophet desires to see good in your life. That prophet has the heart of God towards you. That prophet is carrying the mind of Jesus towards you. The reason why Jesus sends his king to you is because the king is carrying the same mandate as the Lord, having the same motive thereof, having the same thought life, having the same uh compassion and passion and zeal and fervency and continuance and diligence towards you. Like I use all them big words, continuance, diligence, fervency towards you. I'm... That's for all you educated saints. A divine king is a divine thing to your eternal equation. A divine king is a divine thing to your eternal equation. When God plants a king in your life, he's planting the kingdom in your life. When God plants his king in your life, he's planting his kingdom in your life. That's why if you find you listen to the king, you find yourself growing in anointing, joy, happiness, laughter, and liberty. You can't be around a divine king and not become wise. The person that God ordains to be a king to you will not rule you into rebellion. They'll school you into righteousness. Write that down. That's a wisdom door. That's a wisdom door. That's a wisdom door. The king that God sends to you will not rule you into rebellion. They'll school you into righteousness. A, a divine king is a tutor. I'll tutor you into the way that God does things. Why do someone need a tutor in class? Because they need further teaching on adapting to the curriculum that's being revealed, that's being presented to them. They need advanced and extended explanation on the curriculum that's being shown to them. So, so here's the powerful thing about this. The divine king on the earth is a, is a tutor that teaches you how to digest spiritual foods that your belly are not in common with. Because there are some foods that you do not know how to swallow without a trainer. Because many have choked on it in years past. Many have choked on it in generations past. Many have choked on it in uh, weeks past, years past. Many have tasted of the beginning parts and as they went further and further into it, they completely lost the ability to digest. Okay? That realm of God, how he functions, what he requires, and what he's looking for. A divine king is a divine thing to your eternal equation. A divine king is a tutor teaching you what is needed in order for you to become more prophetic. Now, saints, King Solomon was a prophet. David was a prophet. They were all kings, but they were prophets. The kingly and the priestly anointing are so significant because Solomon was a king that prophesied and he was a prophet that was kingly. David was a king that prophesied and was a prophet that was kingly. Jesus was a king 
that prophesied. And he was a prophet that was kingly. So now Jesus released prophets, kings that prophesy and prophets that are kingly. It's the continuation of the Jesus lineage. Saints, let me say this to you. Jesus's lineage did not start in Matthew. Jesus's lineage started before time began. Before time began. Adam was the beginning of the lineage. Adam got cut off the lineage. You can be cut off. Uh, you can be cut off of the lineage if you are not careful. If you don't value it, you can be cut off. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 17. It said, if some of the branches was, were uh, be broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if you boast, Thou bearest not the root, but the root bears you. I'll explain all this. Don't worry about the, the, the vocabulary and the verbiage. I'll explain, you know, how we do. Thou, in verse 19, thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Look at verse 20. Well, because of unbelief. <laughs> it's funny because some of y'all are like, ah, da, 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 ah, da, da, da. <laughs> I can hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Papi. <laughs> I'm with you, Papi. You trying to stay, you trying to stay with what I'm saying. You don't know what I'm saying. I'm just saying, thou thee. Verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, oh, they were broken off. Oh, and thou standest by faith. Be not high minded by fear. Now that's verse 20. This is what I want you to see. It says, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you are standing by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Look at verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Verse 22. Behold, uh-huh. Therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severities, for severities, what do you want for me? But toward the goodness, 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 if thou continue in her goodness, otherwise, other ways, other words, thou shalt be cut off. Say another word. Now, <laughs> that's if Pinky was a preacher. <laughs> that's if Pinky was a preacher. Now, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Romans chapter 11, verse 17 to 24. It's talking about if the Jewish people were cut off so that we can be engrafted into this salvation and have Jesus as Lord and experience the power, the glory, the fire of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. If they were cut off so that we can be engrafted in, it was saying, don't become proud about this because you can be cut off too at any given time. Because according to how God pitted, it, it was like we were the alternative. Watch this. I, I, I bring it home. Let's go to Isaiah 65 verse 1. I'm in my pastor anointing. You know, a pastor is not somebody with a building. A pastor is someone that God has ordained over sheep. 
You know that, right? A lot of people don't even know that. They don't know that that's an office. A pastor is an office. Ephesians says Jesus gave some apostles, uh, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. A pastor is over sheep. You understand this? So a pastor is not just somebody that's in a building. A, a pastor is someone that has been ordained by God, authorized to lead people in the ways of righteousness. That's what a pastor is. I'm a pastor. <laughs> see, see, here's what Peter did. Peter tried to do what a lot of people are doing today. The power of God is moving on the Mount of Transfiguration. Elijah and Moses are there. Look what he does. He asks Jesus, can I build a tabernacle for Moses, Elijah, and you? What is Peter saying? I need to build a church for y'all. I need to build a church for y'all because this not supposed to be. Everybody got synagogues. This can't be so much power and not be housed in a building. And Jesus said, no, I do not want a building for this. That's what Jesus said. So something that you want to catch is that there are people that are anointed by God to be a pastor. You looking for a building? No. I'm not about a building. I am a builder. I've come to build you. You are the building. Huh? That Jesus' spirit and my spirit wants to live in. Some of you are saying, oh, Jesus, he done went to the left. <laughs> I said, your, 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 your temple, your tabernacle is the building that Jesus' spirit and my spirit wants to live in. The Bible said that Elisha had a double portion of Elijah's spirit. The spirit. That's why I plant my seeds in you, which is my word, my doctrine, my teachings, my wisdom, my revelations from God that he has given me a steward over. over. This is the gospel of prophet Joshua Holmes. Apostle Paul had his gospels. It's a revelation that God gives to a specific man. He's not given to everybody. He's he everybody has a specified revelation that God gives to them. Everybody does. And there's not many that's walking it. And that's why there's so much jealousy and there's a lack of understanding about even what I'm saying right now. Isaiah 65 verse one says, I am sought of them that ask not for me. And I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. Verse two, I have spread out my hands all day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Verse three, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves. Wow. And lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and the broth of abominable things in their vessels. Wow. Wow. Look at verse five. Wow. Look at verse five. And they say, this is what they're saying, Jesus says in this text. They say, stand by yourself. Do not come near to me, for I am holier than thou. Does that sound familiar, that phrase, holy art thou? Think they holier than thou? Look what Jesus says in this text. 
they say this is what their heart is saying because they're proud. This is what that's why you see you ever meet people they are real proud. They think oh you can't you know I'm too high. I'm... Smell like Tupperware. <laughs> Isaiah sixty five. Verse 5 says, they say in their heart, I am holier than thou. Watch this. Look what the Lord responds to this. He says, these are a smoke in my nose. Wow. So they smell like cigarettes. <laughs> the Lord said they smell like black, black amount. <laughs> They smell like sulfur. Look what it says right here. There are smoke in my nose and a fire that burneth all the day. Wow. Wow, wow. So saints, if you if you see this text here, it's dealing with something real powerful in this text. This is a very strong text here. The Lord is saying that the people that I want that I I gave myself over to rejected me, and the people that I didn't give myself over to, they were the one that received me. The people that I selected were the ones that betrayed me. The people that I didn't select were the people that became loyal to me. The people that I, that I chose were the ones that left me alone. The people that I did not choose were the one that stood by my side. This is the heart of Jesus in this text. This is the heart of Jesus in this text, saints. You can understand the heart of your Lord if you read Isaiah 65, Isaiah 65 is saying that the people that I, I favored and I was nice to was the one that dogged me out. The people that I did not favor, I, I did not say anything to, I did not open doors for. They were the ones that were there to say, whatever you want. You can have it from me, Lord. Whatever you ask, I'll do it for you, Lord. Whatever you desire, I'll make it happen for you, Lord. See, there's a remnant of people like this. And I'm going to tell you, if you have this heart, don't lose this heart by offense or any demon that's going to try to buffet you. Don't lose this type of heart. This is a pure heart in Isaiah 65. This is what happened to the Seraphonician woman. Her daughter is grievously vexed with a devil, but she's not in the, the uh, what you call, the genealogy, the bloodline of Jesus. But look what Jesus does. Jesus still gives her the miracle of, after he told her that I will not give the food over to dogs, what was the food? It was the healing. It was the manifestation of healing. It was the manifestation of her daughter's deliverance. That so, so watch this here. You notice how Jesus likened her inheritance to bread. So watch this here, saints. When you pray this, give us this day our daily bread. Always know that the daily bread is also all that you desire, whether it be healing in your body, whether it be financial riches, whether it be love, somebody that will protect you, provide for you, help you, show you favor, whether it be promotion, whether it be wisdom, whether it be happiness, whether it be deliverance, whether it be freedom, your daily bread is what Jesus died for you to have, my God. 
That's why Jesus broke the bread and said that this bread represents my body. Because what happened, the fact that Jesus' body was crucified, he gave you license to have the bread. You got the right to enjoy the bread because his body was crucified. He did rise again on the third day and his body is alive and well today. And you have become the body of Christ. So, so that's how sure this covenant is. That's how sure your wealthy place, plenty of money is for you. Health in your body is for you. Joy and happiness and pleasure and prosperity has been scheduled by God for you because the blood of Jesus was the transaction that happened for you to have whatever you like. So we're dealing with a sure covenant. So what do you desire from God? It's going to happen. Don't faint. It's going to happen. Don't become distracted by nonsense. Don't lose your position by deception. Because deception destroys reception. Deception destroys reception. Why couldn't it? they receive Jesus? He came to his own, his own received him not. John chapter one, verse 11, because deception. Deception destroys reception. You can't receive it. You can't hold on to it. You can't grasp it. When the spirit of deception has become an authoritative figure over your life. So you see the heart of Jesus in Isaiah 65. He's saying the people that I reached out for, they don't want me. The people that I labored for, they don't desire me. Now I am being worshipped by people that I never even spoke about. I'm being worshipped and honored by people that I never gave honor to. These ones that I never even selected are the ones that I selected material. Oh, some of y'all need to catch this here. Sometimes, and, and only a few people going to understand this. You may not have been chosen, but you are chosen material. So you, because you are chosen material, God has chosen you. No, no, no. I, I got to say this. I got to say this. Sometimes you were not favored, but you are favored material. So because you operated in the material, the, the, the requirements, the behavior of someone that was favored, God has favored you. Sometimes you was not anointed. Huh? Hmm? But here's what happens. You are anointed material. So now God is anointing you. This is why mantles can be stolen. They can be intercepted. Uh, oftentimes I eat from the table that was not even assigned to me. You hear me? There's a lot of times prophetically I eat from the table that was not assigned to me. Because who it was assigned for, they are not ready for it. They're not corresponding with the fruits that are needed to sustain that type of digestion, uh, 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 that type of eating. So I begin to eat from that table. I don't know if you remember when David, he was hungry and he went go pluck food. And he went into like the holy place, that tabernacle place, and he began to eat the showbread. What's going on? David is eating food 
that were for other priests. He was eating food that were for other priests. Somebody's saying they want to see Jesus face to face. He that have seen me have seen Jesus. <laughs> the showbread, it represented a food. It represented, it was assigned to the priests. But here comes David and he takes it. This is what goes on when you are faithful and you're obedient and you're righteous and you're following in the spirit. You are operating in intercepting. Please no scriptures. Nobody writes scriptures. I done said this already. Don't write scriptures unless I say. Nobody writes scriptures. Follow my doggone instructions. Nobody writes scriptures. This is not a college institution. Everybody needs to stay focused on my message. No scriptures. Elijah had sons already. Do you understand this? He had sons that were already his sons. So why did God say go anoint Elisha in your place? Go anoint Elisha in your place. Elisha was taking the mantle and running with it. Do you understand this? God picked Elisha. There was other sons. Elijah, Elisha wasn't the first person he mentored. If you remember, Elijah had, uh, Elijah had other sons. That's why the Bible said that there were sons that came and said, do you know your master going to be taken from you today? He had other sons. So why is this mantle, why is the favor so strong on Elisha? Elisha is favor material. Elisha is double portion material. Elisha is receptivity material. Elisha is, I'll leave anything for you, my prophet, material. See, we don't have many people like this. Everybody trying to hold on to stuff. What are you going to leave for your prophet? We love to say, oh, I'm leaving this for God because we want to sound good before people. That don't get you no persecution. What are you going to leave for your prophet? Some of y'all are not willing to leave dusty folk for your prophet. What are you willing to leave for your prophet? Because Elijah had to leave. Everything for Elijah. And as he did it as unto Elijah, he was doing it as unto God. You must always remember that. What you do for the prophet, you are doing for Jesus himself is no different. There is no separation. What you are doing for your prophet, you are doing for Jesus. Every time you sow money into your prophet, you are sowing into Jesus Christ himself. The money is going into Jesus's hands for his vision, his business to be accomplished. That's why Jesus says, if you give, it shall be given unto you. Because what Jesus is saying, you're not just giving to that prophet. You're not just giving it to that man of God. You're not just giving into that ministry. You're giving to me and I'm going to make sure it comes back to you. Because I am not El Chipo. I'm not El Paso. <laughs> I'm El Shaddai. Huh? I am not... 
None of them L's. And I'm not going to take no L. I am El Shaddai. I'm El Elyon. Huh? So he wants you to be mentored by your prophet. Is the will of God and is beautiful. That's why the devil will try to make you inaccurate prophetically all the time. If you ever study, if you ever study, you'll see that there is so many times that God is planting a prophet in the life of somebody because they are about to step into a double portion realm of functionality. If you're a woman, it's because you are supposed to be in the place where you're not struggling like other women. It's because God is giving you extra ability, extra grace, extra glory so that you will not be an average woman. Listen, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to say this again. If you study these women in the Bible, and I'm going to say this. If you study these women in the Bible, for a man to have 700 wives and 300 concubines, why were they fighting every day? Why weren't nobody jealous of nobody? Why wasn't their, their bittering, bickering? Why wasn't their cat fighting? Why wasn't that happening? These women were special women. They had the spirit of God governing them and they was not concerned about every doggone body. They was only focused and minding their doggone business and they were doing what God wanted them to do to help the king. That's the secret to life. I'm going to say this and I'm going to say this because this is the strength of my life. I do not study other ministries. I do not watch what other men and women are doing. What God tells me to do is my only focus, is my only passion, is my only desire, and I do it excellently. I don't do it lackadaisically because if I if I did it lackadaisically, I could uh, it, it'll only happen because I'm corrupted by looking at somebody else's assignment. My assignment is my assignment, and I'm assigned to invest my energy, my focus, my livelihood, my faith, my joy, my peace, my happiness, the best of who I am with what God instructed me. Whatever God tells you to do, that's where you invest your focus, you invest your concentration, you invest your joy, invest your peace, invest, invest your, your, your inspiration, your virtue, your livelihood, all of you, you invest your body, your soul, your spirit into the instruction that God has given to you and you will not struggle. If you go to the left or if you go to the right, you can't expect the power that's in the middle because the middle is carrying a power that you got to have middle focus. You got to have middle faith. You got to have middle tenacity, middle boldness, middle concentration. If you concentrate over to the left, don't expect the middle to go well. If you go concentrate over to the right, don't expect the middle to go well. If you don't stay in the middle, you will not have the power that is assigned to the middle. And then you'll be little. Then you'll become an ant instead of an elephant. Now the devil will walk over you and trample you underfoot. See, if God pits me with the straight and narrow, I'm not going to go the way that leads to destruction, the broad way. If God pits me in the narrow way, I am not going to study the broad way. The broad way is not for me. So if I am anointed for the narrow way, my job is to feed in the ne narrow way, to digest in the narrow way, to follow the narrow way, to study the narrow way, to protect the narrow way, to guard the narrow way. I don't need to be looking at the broad way. I don't need to know who's in the broad way. I don't need to know who's assigned in the broad way. Because that's not where my strength is. My strength is in the narrow's way. That's going to be the secret to your life. I'm telling you. That's going to be the secret to your life. I don't study people. I don't study no doggone people. You hear what I said? 
I ain't studying no, no doggone people. Prophet Joshua Holmes, stay fresh because I studied Jesus. And whatever Jesus want from Prophet Joshua Holmes, he can have it from me. I'm not going to do it the way that you did it. I ain't going to follow the way that you did it because I am not you and you is not me. I'm going to follow the regiment huh? of how God wants it. Saints, I'm going to show you something spiritual. I'm going to show you something spiritual. You notice I just said I don't want no scriptures on here. And then people start asking for scriptures. I'm going to show you how spiritually that's how you know that God is governing me. Because the spirit of Satan is asking for the very thing that God just said he doesn't want presented. Hereby you understand witchcraft. You understand? That's why I'm, that's why I'm here to train y'all. I'm a trainer. I come to help you so that you don't miss God like a lot of people are missing God. That's why I'm so hard right now and strong because I know what God wants. And being happy-go-lucky when it comes to truth won't always get the job done. You got to deliver the truth to people so that they could have an opportunity to be excellent before God. If you don't have the truth, you can't be excellent. Many people want to do what I do, but they don't want to be who I be. They don't want to operate how I operate. Listen, me preaching on here is the last level of who I am. Me on here, this is, this is food. I got other ingredients. So you see me up on here preaching, you think it's all easy. I want to do it too. You're not anointed to do it. Doggone it, sit your behind down and learn. When you learn, then God will decide when he won't release you. And don't ask doggone God, is he ready to release you? That's the dumbest thing you can ask God. Don't ask God if he ready to release you. When he ready to release you, he going to come to you and tell you, do this and do that. Saints, I didn't start off preaching in no public. Huh? I started off preaching with my actions, preaching with my submission, preaching with my surrender. Stop asking God, is you ready to use me out here? No, no don't ask him none of that. When, it, when he see feet fit, he going to tell you. And if he ain't tell you, don't ask him. That's like your little child telling you, oh, you, are you going to take me to Toys R Us today? Y'all will get mad. Y'all bust that child in the mouth. Some of y'all will. Some of you, you mother parents, you'll bust them, in, bust them with a slap. That's what you call it. And we ain't going to tell nobody, but you'll bust them with a slap. If they come and ask you, what you going to do for them. Some of y'all do that. Think about that. You would beat that child just because they came and asked you what you was going to do for them. And then you don't think about God. You don't think it's disrespectful when you go to God and say, oh, is it, is it your time you going to use me yet? When I'm ready to use you, I'll tell you behind. If I don't tell you, don't, don't ask. You do that same thing with your children, but you don't think that you got that from God. God had you present order to that child. That child, the reason why you clap back at the child, because you're teaching them, hey, you might think that this is innocent for you to ask me, but according to roles, you can't override my authority. That's not respect for you to talk to me in this manner because you don't have the, the leverage to do that. So here's the secret. This is the same thing you got to remember with God. Because when you're dealing with God, you don't want to be that same disrespectful child that's going to him about stuff that is not in your authority to be going to him about. It's not the time for that. You don't want to be somebody because some of y'all be asking God the dumbest questions. Yeah, he said, ask and you shall receive. But you need wisdom. You jack God's mood up. 
You don't want to be up there asking the Lord, Lord, when are you going to send my man to me? Lord, when, when, when are you going to get me out of this situation? Why would you ask God such a stupid question? Don't ask God stuff that, that, are, that is foolish. Weigh out what you asking him. Dumb stuff like that. And then you start feeling convicted and you start saying, oh, I feel so bad that I do something wrong. Yeah, you did something wrong. God letting you know, shut up. He letting you know, don't come to me in that manner no more. That's why you feel the little turn off. Saints, you know when you're in prayer, there's a shift. You can feel the atmosphere. You got a soul. God gave you a soul. He don't want you to be just uh, aimless. With all the different stuff that you asking. No, you better be careful. You better make sure that the spirit of God is with you with what you're talking about to God. Because there's some stuff you can come to God about. Listen, you want to talk about Tyrone. Oh, Lord, I'm asking you to show me what to do for Tyrone. Okay, Tyrone is in jail because he just robbed the store. And you up there asking God, what do you want me to do for Tyrone? God looking at you like, huh? Are you operating and asking me about somebody that I'm clearly telling you that that person is getting the consequence for robbing? You asking me, what am I telling you to do for Tyrone? Huh? And see, see, people getting offended on here. They're getting offended because I'm talking to a lot of you all because you got witchcraft spirits on you when you talk to God. You the only one getting offended because I'm dealing with your witchcraft behind. And that's why your prayer is not being answered. Because Jesus told me there's so many people that come to him on nonsense and he don't want to hear your nonsense. You a person, you don't want certain people to ask you stuff and you think that God created you in his image and likeness and everything that you talk to him about, he want to talk to you about. He is a person, he's God, he's a king. You can't talk to a king about what you want. And he's the king of kings at that. So if a king, Esther had to fast three days to know what to say to a king that was on earth. How much more you need to be careful about what you say on earth to God. Only people get mad at this are those of you all that always babbling off at the mouth. You talk stupid stuff. You don't get no prayers answered. You ain't got no anointing flowing on you. You get angry at when I'm talking like this because I'm telling you the doggone truth. I'm telling you the truth. God don't want to hear all the stuff that y'all talking about. It's always, and it's always you black people. Y'all be the main one praying and wicked as hell. I come to talk to y'all tonight. I come to deal with this prophetic tonight. Y'all, y'all black people be the worst ones. Always in prayer, always up there hooping and hollering. And they're up there don't even know how to love your brother. Don't even know how to submit yourself. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse two. It says, be not rash with your mouth. And let not your heart be hasty to utter anything before God. You want a scripture? You want a doggone scripture? I just gave you a scripture. If you would read the Bible, you would know. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 2. No wonder Apostle Paul said the woman needs to shut up in the church. It's in the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 2. Be not rash with your mouth and let not your heart be hasty to utter anything before God. What part of that do you not understand? You need another scripture? Scripture police? Y'all up there always want scriptures. If you would read your Bible, you would know what it said. God don't want to hear us talk anything to him. I know. I've been in services where people have asked dumb questions. Huh? They, they ask stuff. They tell you stuff. And you feel the anointing lifting off of you. And you got to minister to people. And you got to shut them up. My last service, I didn't hang around with nobody. 
my last service, they were, they, they, I was secluded. I didn't do no practice with nobody, did nothing with nobody. Because I don't need my atmosphere being messed up. I don't want to hear no carnality. I don't want to hear about nothing. I need to stay in the realm where God is. And sometimes people say the dumbest stuff. Prophet, how is your mother doing? How is my mother doing? <laughs> I don't give a dog about how my mother doing. What, what does that have to do with the assignment at hand? Sometimes people think it's innocent. They ask you innocent questions. Uh, you know, do you have family? What does that, what does that have to do? Huh? What does that have to do with the assignment at hand? If you remember, it was Jesus that he's preaching and they're telling him, your mother, your, they outside. Jesus said, who is my mother? What are you talking about? I'm on an assignment. You telling me about some woman that you think is my mother because I came out of her? Right now, I'm, I'm functioning in my God place. I'm showing you my God realm. You, you telling me about some mother outside asking for me. This time is, is surrogated for God and God alone. You got to be careful what you say. Look, look what it say in Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse six. Suffer not your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. Neither say before your angel that it was an error. Wherefore, God should be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands. Now, do you understand what this text is saying? It's telling you right here in this text that be careful. You don't want to end up trying to say stuff to God to make him angry. This, this is what I just was telling you. I was just talking about this on this line. I just said that there are things that God don't want to hear from you. He not trying to talk to you on that subject. And I'm giving you scripture because some of y'all too religious. And then the lady that's religious, then she talking about she's speaking blessings over me. I'm already blessed, baby. <laughs> what? Come on, 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 come out, come out, come out your slumber. Come out your slumber. If I didn't have a scripture for you, then you would have cursed me. Come on, saints. Saints, saints, some some something is happening. Y'all so y'all really crazy. You just don't know that you're crazy. A man of God can be preaching the word, you come interrupt him to contradict him, and then when he got the material, you say, Oh, I speak blessings over you. I was already blessed. That's why I'm empowered to do what I'm doing. God trying to get something to you, but you can't receive it because you up there all up in your pride. I don't know what's wrong with people, saints. I don't know what's wrong with people. Then, then now you speaking blessings over me. But why weren't you speaking blessings over me when, I, when you came on the line? So you speaking blessings because you can't contradict the wisdom. Jesus said, I'll give you a mouth in wisdom that even your enemies can't resist. When the prophet comes into your life and you're being mentored by a prophet, you're going to experience that heightened level of prophetic things. Now, remember Ecclesiastes 5, 6 just talked about the angel saying before the angel. So when you're praying, you're talking, there's an angel listening to you. That's why when Zacharias began to ask how is this going to happen in Luke chapter one? That's why the angel told him, don't, you know, he muted him because the angel is always present when you're speaking, when you're decreeing things. So be careful that you're not saying stuff that you don't want to happen. The angel is present. Do you understand this? With the angel being present, that means that things can go for your good or they can go for your bad. But what are you saying? God told Ezekiel, prophesy to the dry bones. 
The reason why he needed to prophesy is because those bones wasn't supposed to stay dry. Watch this here. There are things in the presence of Ezekiel that God wants to change, but he's using his mouth to change them. How much things in your life God has around you that he wants you to change? How many times does God want to use your mouth for you to be the one that changes it? He wants you to prophesy something different. He wants you to say something different. So with Ezekiel, Ezekiel, now God is asking him, can these bones live? And now watch what Ezekiel is doing. Lord, only you know. Ezekiel knows, but he doesn't know that he knows. He is being taught God functionality. Ezekiel, like a lot of religious people, they'll go hop back and say, well, only God can do this. But God is telling Ezekiel, no, no, no. You have my nature, my permission, my authority, my jurisdiction, my favor on you for you to prophesy and decree a thing over these bones and these bones will respond to your words like it responds to my words. How many times is God telling you that? That there is a response. Man, I, I, I'm going to just start blocking people that's distracting the message. I ain't with all this stuff. I don't know what's, I don't know how retarded our generation is, but dog, we we got we got slow generation. I'm up here giving you keys, deliverance keys tonight. People up there asking all type of dumb stuff tonight. I'm just gonna start blocking people. I'm giving people a chance to hear the gospel, the good news. They up there asking me dumb stuff. You pray to get solutions, okay? You pray to get solutions. Okay, somebody is preaching solutions to you and you're asking them to pray. I'm already in a higher dimension than prayer. <laughs> you listen, you pray to get solutions and answers. I'm giving you solutions and answers. I'm releasing the, ha the harvest of prayer and people still trying to get me in the seed. You understand? I I'm giving you wisdom here. They trying to get me in the seed and I'm giving them the harvest. The harvest is higher. It's the answer. It's the response. It's, what, it's what's needed. Take the answer. Don't keep on trying to take, take the harvest. Don't keep trying to hop into the seed. When the harvest done come, take the harvest. Saints, this is why when you see Jesus went to Jairus' house, this is why Jesus pits everybody out of the house. He pits everybody outside of the house because what they're saying to Jesus is not what he wants in his system. What they're saying to Jesus, he don't want it in his heart. Because his heart is where the anointing is flowing, where the glory for miracles is flowing. He doesn't need that in his mind. So he blocks them out. He pits them out of the house because what he's about to do, he don't need wrong words being spoken that will release death into the atmosphere because the girl is already dead. Saints, Jesus was such a genius. He's still a genius. He's a genius forever. Look at the genius nature of Jesus. He knows that the people are speaking death and she's already dead. So, so watch this. Jesus doesn't even say that she's dead. He says that she's sleeping. Because Jesus is keeping the life flowing in his words. Watch this. The fact that he's releasing hope, he's releasing life. Because hope deferred make the heart sick. And if the heart is where the anointing is flowing. Jesus didn't want his heart to become sick. 
So Jesus is speaking hope because he wants his heart to remain in the anointing. And he's pitting them out because they are atmosphere skeletons. My God. You catch this? They're atmosphere skeletons. So he knows that they are atmosphere skeletons. So he pits them out because their words will only add death to the dead girl. See, saints, you got to understand the nature of Jesus. That's why Jesus be pitting people out of your life. Because you don't understand some of y'all already be dead. You are already in a place where you, you're not really focused. You're not, you separated from God in so many ways. So what Jesus was do is he'll pit people out of your life so that he can resurrect you, quicken you again, bring you back into your convictions, bring you back into your worship, bring you back into your righteousness, bring you back into the way that you are supposed to go. That's what he did with the girl. She was already dead. And here these people are speaking more death on her. You can be broke and people still speaking more brokenness over you. You can be confused and people speaking more confusion over you. You can be already sad and people speaking more sadness over you. You can be already in sin and people speaking more sin over you. You can already be distracted and people speaking more distraction over you. You can already be hopeless and people speaking more hopeless over you. But what Jesus will come through a man, my God. <laughs> That's what he did. Jairus is standing right there. Jesus is standing right there, but he's a man. He'll come through a man and the man will be responsible to release the will of God in your atmosphere. To get who needs to be out. Sometimes it's your doggone children. You might love your doggone children, but they're grown. Yeah, you got to remember that. Yeah, they can mess up your atmosphere now. Because everything that you taught them, they, they won't act like they don't know nothing that you they heard you said. They won't act like they didn't see God move. They won't act like they don't know Jesus for themselves. They won't act stupid. So they stupid, so treat them as stupid is. You ain't got to disown them. But when you see them throwing that pity party, you're going to learn today. I ain't encourage you on nothing. <laughs> Some of y'all, I'm giving you wisdom for life. I ain't encouraging you on nothing. And you better come over to Jesus, find out that, that what I was telling you was right or else. You hurt? You hurt? Well, you're going to be hurt until you come over on Jesus' side. That's what they need to hear. You see, sometimes you see your children up there going through stuff and you up there trying to pamper them and comfort them. No, you need to tell them, hey, listen, baby, you're going to stay right there until you come over to Jesus' side. I done told you that people don't mean you no good. I done told you that people ain't going to do you right. I done let you know that. So you hurt. You're going to stay hurt until you come over here on Jesus' side. 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 That's the only way you're going to come out. You're not going to come out because I encourage you. You're not going to come out because I'm telling you nice things. You're going to come out because you finally gave your life over to Jesus. Come over on Jesus' side. Sometimes that's sometimes you're trying to give them solutions. That, that ain't no solution what you're telling them. It's going to be all right. No, it's not going to be all right. Son, that's going to happen to you again because Jesus is trying to get your attention. Nah, this is not the first time and this is not the last. Oh, you hurt? You betrayed? Well, you're about to get betrayed again. I'm trying to help you. Jesus is trying to call out to you. And even though something may happen to you that make you feel bad, it's good if you was afflicted. That's what David said. It was good for me to be afflicted. What is David talking about? David saying it's good that stuff happened to me that I didn't want to happen to me because it was all God behind the scenes getting my attention to another realm, another dimension, another anointing, another grace, another glory, another anointing. I needed to be afflicted with this so that I wouldn't be complacent, so that I would not sit where I needed to be, so that I would not stay where I was, so that I would not accept no deception, so that I would not receive no laziness. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, this is what God been looking for. He been looking for people that will keep on advancing in the glory. It said from faith to faith, from glory to glory. You see that Moses went on a 40 day, 40 night fast. Did you see Moses stop? Moses kept on going. You see Jesus going a 40 day, 40 night fast. Did you see Jesus stop? Jesus kept on going. You see Esther, she went through the six months period, the six month period of going through them oils and those scents and all those perfumes and all the disciplinary things and being chastened and being corrected and being molded as a woman. Do you see her change when she became the queen? She kept on fasting. She kept on listening to God. She kept on honoring Mordecai. Mordecai was able to prophesy to her because she kept on going. You got to keep on going. Don't stop. Just because time comes, you better stay consistent, stay diligent. Stay, stay on the floor of things. Don't let yourself drift off because you think that you accomplished a place with God. There's another place with God that he calling you to. That place that you've been in, it was all awesome. It was good. But you need to come up higher because the greater demons that's going to attack you, if you don't let Jesus raise you up to the next level, those demons are going to defeat you. You better come up to the next plane so that when there's a terrorist attack, they won't hijack your plane. They won't don't crash your plane. You better learn the engineering anointing of your destiny and begin to flow with God in a new dimension. Let him take you to somewhere you've never been before. Don't stop where you are. You got to keep on going. Yeah, you good at finances. You might got $5,000 in your account. You might got $3,000 in your account, but there's more money God got for you. You supposed to be a kingdom financier. You got to fund the gospel. You got to fund the anointing. You got to get this word out to nations and globes and people all across this world. And you need the money. Keep on sowing. Keep on honoring God. You, you haven't forgiven people so much that you don't need to forgive no more. You need to keep on forgiving. You need to keep on forgiving. Don't, don't, don't say, oh, I done forgave enough people. I, that's it. I ain't forgiving them. No, you better keep on forgiving. Ain't, ain't, there's not an amount of people that can do you something in the earth that can take away your forgiveness. You better keep on forgiving. You better keep on praising God. You better keep on giving him thanks. You better keep on being focused. You better keep on being humble. You better keep on being attentive. You better keep on being available. Don't stop using the weapons of your warfare. You got to keep on using them. See, saints, that's how that prophetic anointing begins to intensify on you. It begins to really intensify on you. Why? Because God sees that now you're using the weapons, the instructions that he has given to you. That's how you become more anointed. Elisha left everybody to follow Elijah, but he didn't stop there. Watch. Now he's with Elijah later on. Look. He can become complacent, but he keeps on going. Did you see Elisha say, okay, you going to Jericho? Okay, I'll see you when you come back. No. You don't, you don't, you don't see him, you don't see him talking like that. You don't see him saying, uh, when you get back here, I'll meet you. You never see Elisha losing his boldness. He still is going where Elijah is. He could stop and say, no, I done did enough. No, I done left my family. I done did everything I need. Huh? Here's the secret. If this was Elisha's assignment to serve Elijah, he should never create An ending period. A deadline. See saints here's the problem. So many of you are, are creating deadlines with God. You're saying Lord I'm going to serve you until this time. And if this time come and nothing happened the way I think it should happen. I'm going to stop. 
Stop creating deadlines with God. What's your assignment is your assignment permanently unless God switches it. I don't have moments where I'm saying, oh, I'm just going to preach until this time and then after that is over. No, no, no. It's my assignment. So I'm not looking for a deadline to stop doing my assignment. My assignment is whatever God has given me and my, my whole passion, my whole joy, my whole pleasure is in that. Have you found joy in what brings God joy? Because you got to link your joy with his. You got to link your happiness with his. Have you adapted to what gives God pleasure? You got to adapt to making him happy. That's your assignment in this life. Above all else, above everything else, that's your assignment to make God happy. And you got to aim at it. You got to chase after it. You got to pursue it with all your strength, with all your ability, with all your focus, with all your attentiveness. You got to get that done. You know, the Lord oftentimes, here's what he does. You know, there'll be times where you, you really is supposed to come out of a situation before a time. And he has, a, he has set a time for you to come out of that situation. Do you know that there's sometimes that God will literally, he'll let you stay in that fire a little longer to see if you're going to burn up or you're going to stand your ground. Sometimes, saints, God did decide that he about to deliver you in three weeks. And those three weeks come and he go tell the devil, hey, you see my daughter right there? You see my son right there? Have you considered this? Them. I know that you think that they're just waiting for this three-week period. Guess what? Let's pit them in this for another three months. Let's see what they're going to do. Let me show you that they keep on praising me. Let me show you that they're going to keep on fasting. They're going to keep on walking in love. They're going to keep on forgiving. They're going to keep on worshiping. They're going to keep on sowing. They're going to keep on uh, praising me. They're going to keep on being patient. Let me show you that they're not with me just because of the money that I can give them, just because of the cars I can give them just because of the life I could give them. But they love me even when stuff not going their way. You don't know how many times that Jesus is talking to the evil spirits and telling them, have you considered my queen right here, my king right here? I know that they'll stand their ground against your wiles and all your attacks and all the things that you want to send against them. I know that they got endurance. I know that they got heart. I know that they got boldness. I know that they love me for me. And watch, I'm going to let them stand stay in this fire just a little while longer just to show you that they're not going to fail me. And say some of you all, you don't understand when your life is in the spotlight and you got a mean attitude and you got a mean dispensation about you and you walking around all upset talking about God told me he going to do this. When he going to do it for me? I heard this prophesied to me. When the prophecy going to come to pass? I've been waiting all this time. You don't know that demons up there looking at you and saying, see God, look at them. Look how they trading out on you. Look how they talking. I told you, I told you that they wasn't going to hold their ground. I told you that they was going to lose faith. I told you that they was going to get weary. I told you that they was going to get mad. And saints, you don't understand that your reaction is connected to God's reputation. Your reaction is connected to God's reputation. And saints, while God proving a point through you, and you up there not even cooperating because you're not in the spirit. You're in the flesh. So you don't even know that you're doing wrong. You just feel like, oh, I, I think it's time for me. I think it, I should be in my promised land now. I should be in this now. And you're not seeing that your reaction is connected to God's reputation. How many times? How many times? Sometimes God don't want you to do all that stuff you're doing. You're doing too much. You're doing too much. You just need to let him have his way. You say, Lord, let your will be done. Pray like that. If, if you're praying, because saints, do you know that there's some prayers that can make you angry? Yeah. You go to God on a wrong case. You go to him with, with a wrong approach. You find yourself start getting angry. Now you're mad at God. Now you're not going to admit that you're mad at God, but you're mad at God. You're offended. Well, why you let her die? Okay. Why would I go to God and ask him, 
why he let her die. Because now I done positioned myself to be angry. Saints, all questions are not good. All questions are not good. Saints, you ask certain questions. You see how those questions lead you into anger. Everybody on this earth have asked questions that led them into anger. You go ask a pedophile why he why he before the judge. Why did you molest my, my child? That question is not helping you. That question is creating unforgiveness stronger. It's creating bitterness stronger. It's creating retaliation stronger. Have you ever seen when somebody, they, they had the one that loved ones murdered by somebody in the courtroom. They said, why you took my daughter from me? Why you took my son from me? Do you think that that question is helping them? So, so when somebody say you got to forgive, you say, you hear their response. It's hard. I can't forgive. It's hard. Why are they talking like that? Because the questions they asked kept them in bondage. See, saints, listen, ask questions that's going to give you wisdom, not wickedness. Write that down. That's a wisdom door. Ask questions that's going to give you wisdom, not wickedness. That's a wisdom door. Don't ask questions that's going to give you wickedness. Ask questions that's going to give you wisdom. You need things that's going to empower you to be more like Jesus concerning people. If it's not going to help you, you don't need to be speaking it out your mouth. Your mouth is like a steering wheel. It decides which direction your life goes. Stuff go to the left because you went left. Keep on going right even when stuff going left and watch how I got to turn to the direction you in. You don't want stuff to go over to the left where the devil is taking advantage of you and he, he doing stuff. No, no. Keep the stuff over to the right. Keep on saying what God needs you to say so that you can stick with God about it. You don't need to be bopping over to the other side. Because once you start speaking a certain way, here, now, you done drove your car in the very direction that you said you wasn't going to go. There's something called a drive-by shooting. And saints, this is something that Satan often does with your mind, with your soul. Let me tell you something. Satan is not always in position to even go against you. Sometimes he does a drive-by shooting. He'll drive by you to see if you still in faith, if you still in your virtue, if you still in your dominion, if you still in your masculinity as a man. And then he'll pop, 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 pop to see if there's any areas where he can harm you, injure you, damage you. And saints, sometimes you ain't got your bulletproof vest on. Sometimes you ain't got... What you need to have on, you ain't got on the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. So he shoots you in the head and bow, you, you out. He shoots you in the chest, bow, because you ain't got on the breastplate. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And, and you ain't got on the defense system. So when he driving by shooting you, he see that, oh, bam, she ain't got on the helmet of salvation. Her mind ain't delivered. Her mind stuck on something that's bringing her bondage. His mind is stuck on something that's bringing him bondage. So pow, shoot, it, shoot you in the head. And now, bam, bam, bam. Now you confused. Now, now you depressed. Now you discouraged because you don't know that you're being wounded in your mind. And Satan is throwing those fiery darts at you. He's throwing them bullets at you and he's hitting you in the area that you have not guarded. Can the devil hit you in the area where you did not guard? Yeah. That's what happens oftentimes. You may have on the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth, the sh but you ain't got on the feet shy with preparation. So watch. The devil try to hit you up here. Bam, it ricochet. Try to hit you right here. Bam, it ricochet. Try to hit you down here. And bam, it ricochet. But when he hit you in the feet, bam, it connect. Sometimes you ain't got on the feet shy with preparation for the gospel of peace. So he'll hit you in the area where you're not prepared. That's why you got to be on your P's and Q's, your, 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 your P's and you, you can't be, you can't be lackadaisy with this. You can't play around with this. All areas of your life must be guarded 24 seven. You must be ready. You must be ready. Cause sometimes he know that you got on the helmet of salvation. Sometimes he know you got on the feet shower preparation for the gospel of peace. 
Sometimes he know that you got the better truth. Sometimes he know you got the sword of spirit, but you don't have on the breastplate of righteousness. So the breastplate is going to be targeted. He going to hit you right there in the chest because you don't got on the breastplate. Huh? You got to make sure your breastplate fits you too. Some of y'all, you, you, you A's and you trying to buy double D's and it's falling off of you. Some of y'all double D's and you trying to buy A's. Now you're going to have to make sure your breastplate fits you. <laughs> you try to put on a breastplate that don't fit you. Now you trying to do what you see somebody else do and, and, and function in the ways of God like them. But, but you yourself haven't adapted to what God wants. So, so, so you can put on the app for a time, but it don't fit you. Huh? Think about that. Think about that. David had refused Saul's garments. David didn't receive. Huh? Do you think that David received Saul's gar garments? He didn't want Saul's garments on him. He didn't want Saul's garments uh, he didn't want to go to war with him because that was not his garment for praise and victory. You put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That's what Isaiah says. Prophet Isaiah says, Isaiah, I believe 61. You can't put on somebody else's garments. Huh? If God doesn't want that, you end up in a place where you start losing battles in your life. Listen, never put on the garment of somebody that's been rejected. That's a wisdom door. Some of you all study the people that you're talking to. Is the favor of God on them? Is the favor of a man of God on them? If the favor of a man of God is not on them and you talking to them, you next. <laughs> you never put on the garments of somebody that have failed God. You never put on the garments of somebody that misses God. A lot of times people put on garments of people that don't have God's hand on them and God takes his hand off of you too. Because the garment represented the moment that God said, I take my hands off of you for somebody else. When he see that garment on you, it replays back that same moment. God takes his hand off of you. Does God take his hand off of people? I just read that scripture at the beginning of this, of this scope. I told you about how the Lord talked about don't become proud about your position because you could be cut off. If he cut off the Jewish people so that the Gentile people can be saved, surely he can cut off the Gentile people at any given moment. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? Ain't that something? Ain't that something? So, so if you notice, watch what happens, saints, and I'm going to give you a revelation. I'm going to give you a revelation. Do you know why the people that murdered Jesus, or let me not even say murdered Jesus, they crucified Jesus because he laid down his life. Do you know, let me give you a revelation that you never heard a day in your life. Do you know why the people that crucified Jesus, do you know why they received him in the book of Acts when Peter started preaching to him? Because the Bible said that they gambled for Jesus' garment. They cast lots for his garments. And because his garments was already in the land, he had already blanketed the land to repent. His garments represented conviction. His garments represented salvation. His garments represented deliverance. His garments represented every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. So the fact that Jesus had the garments and after he wore them, they cast lot for the garments, it's 
a revelation to show you that now Jesus' spirit, his power was now dispersed in the land. So that's why you see when the gospel was preached to them again in the book of Acts, you see all of them repented. Because his garments was on the land.